Okay, I think we are live. Hi everyone, thank you for joining. Welcome to the garden. A few housekeeping items. We're not gonna be taking questions during the event, um, but please do type your questions into the Q&A and my co-host Lorena will be um, hosting a question and answer session at the end of the conversation. My guest today is Louisa Durkin, a biodiversity and agri-food systems analyst at Metabolic and a member of the Gerthenberg Global Biodiversity Center. Louisa holds a Bachelor of Science in Molecular Genetics and a Public Health minor from the University of Rochester, New York, and a Master of Science in Bio Biodiversity Systematics from the University of Gerthenberg Nordic Academy for Biodiversity Systematics. Louisa, uh, Louisa has been a guide for my creative practice for over two years now. I truly would not be doing the art and the advocacy that I do today without her generous encouragement, guidance, and knowledge sharing. Since I use naturalist imagery from 1900 and earlier, many species in my artwork have already vanished or are vanishing. Louisa has been really instrumental in helping me to understand the biodiversity crisis and in my transition from being an artist to an artivist. Um, Louisa also helps me keep focused on solutions and she'll be speaking to us today about an often overlooked solution to the climate crisis and biodiversity crisis, um, soil. And I'm gonna to begin today's conversation with a poem from um, All, All We Can Save. Ode to Dirt by Sharon Olds. Dear Dirt, I am sorry I slighted you. I thought that you were only the background for the leading characters, the plants and animals and human animals. It's as if I had loved only the stars and not the sky which gave them space in which to shine. Subtle, various, sensitive, you are the skin of our terrain. You're our democracy. When I understood I had never honored you as a living equal, I was ashamed of myself. As if I had not recognized a character who looked so different from me, but now I can see us all made of the same basic materials cousins of that first exploding from nothing in our intricate equation together. Oh dirt, help us find ways to serve your life. You who have brought us forth and fed us and who at the end will take us in and rotate with us and wobble and orbit. Louisa, welcome to the garden. So happy to have you. Thanks. It's really nice to be here. That was a nice poem. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, I guess I am going to talk about soil now. So I'm gonna share my screen. Cool. So soil um, isn't always the most fun topic, uh, but soil is a system. And if you like systems thinking, uh, like I like systems thinking, uh, then soil provides the ultimate fodder for this. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what soil is composed of, uh, how it supports life, uh, in the ground and what this means for life above ground, uh, how it relates to the evolutionary tree of life, uh, and how humans within a capitalistic system aren't always the best at valuing our natural capital like soil. But this can change, uh, so I want to then talk to you about all the solutions that I see growing in the soil and then understand a little bit about what we can do. So this is straight out of your uh, biology textbook, but it's still relevant. Um, soil is made up of mostly 
air and water, um, kind of like us humans. Um, and the other components of soil are the mineral components, silt, sand, and clay, which are all different uh, element minerals uh, that we give these names to. You can sort of see um, on that triangle at the bottom how the different compositions of soil come together. They give it different pH, different quality, and that's all based on whatever is uh, whatever the earth is made of in that particular location. Um, this little green slice of the pie uh, is also very important. And that's all the organic matter that is living and dead in the soil. So all the carbon life forms uh, that exist. This graphic is really nice from uh, the FAO and it kind of shows um, soil biodiversity, the hidden world under our feet, that there is so much happening below our feet that we perhaps take for granted. Um, in a single uh, teaspoon of soil, there can be uh, thousands of species of bacteria and fungi. There are nematodes, arthropods, there's probably some earthworms nearby. Um, also animals that live in the soil, but most importantly, they're all uh, interconnected. They're interconnected in um, the soil food web, which is a complex web of energy and carbon life forms exchanging energy. Uh, and this is really kind of the crux of the complexity of the soil, of the system that is the soil. Um, we have the plant roots, the fungi that are connected to the plant roots. I like to think of uh, the fungi as kind of the Wi-Fi network for the plants. If you've ever heard of the wood wide web, the um, fungal, most fungi actually exist in the soil and we just see the fruit kind of, if you picture uh, the fungi in the soil as kind of the apple tree and the mushroom that pops up as the apple, um, most of it is invisible to us. But they, uh, the cell of the fungi fuses to the cell of the plant and they exchange information, nutrients and water that way. We also have nematodes, microscopic animals, uh, protozoa, bacteria, earthworms are huge and important soil inhabitants, um, animals, also larger animals in there. But I think, yeah, this concept of understanding that all of these carbon-based life forms are existing in a complex web in the soil is really what I want everybody to be picturing. Um, and the evolutionary tree of life is something that I'm extremely fascinated, uh, fascinated with, understanding that we can um, kind of molecularly trace back uh, a single origin of life on Earth. Um, for example, we know that all uh, life on Earth was colonized by fungi about a billion years ago, so they truly are the basis of soil. Um, and if you look at this diagram in the middle of the screen, that is from the Tree of Life website. They, uh, this is, it kind of looks like a bush actually. So it is, this is the evolutionary tree of life. Um, and you can see kind of how everything is interconnected here. Um, on the bottom left, it's, it's uh, microbes, so bacteria and archaea. And then we kind of have this uh, dispersal into um, plants, animals, and fungi. And here we can see that fungi are more closely related to animals than to plants. Uh, but yeah, this just shows kind of all of the range of species. And out of this range, I've just selected a few that live in soil. Um, on the bottom, we have these mycelial threads um, that we were just talking about that fuse to plant roots, um, like that tree on the left. And then above is a, a mole. They live in the soil, they really aerate. So that 25% of uh, soil that's air is really important for animals like this. And they provide a lot of that structure just like earthworms do. Um, and on the right, you can see all the different microbes that are coexisting in the soil. 
just like we have microbiomes on our skin and in our gut, um, soil has its own microbiome and that really changes depending on uh, the different conditions. So what, uh, this is kind of what soil is made up of, but what does soil do for us? So I think that's always kind of a relevant and important question that we need to be asking. Um, and so what is healthy soils? That's soil that is able to exist in this complex state to be an ecosystem, um, to kind of thrive. And, and the more complex a system is, the more um, carbon it stores because life forms are made up of carbon. So the more uh, carbon it stores, the more um, interactions, the more energy in that system. So that's what healthy soils look like. Also, there's, they're not contaminated with pollution um, and they're not eroding. They're kind of, they have structure, they have roots, uh, keeping them stratified. Um, so that's kind of, that's where our plants are happiest in soil that uh, has structure, is able to retain water. Really compacted soil that doesn't have that uh, air quality cannot hold water. Um, soil is really important for human health, actually. A lot of our medicines come from uh, ingredients that are found in soils, so microbial uh, enzymes and these types of things that we discover in the soil. Also, soil plays a huge role in water purification. Um, I'm living right now in the Netherlands, and they're very famous for their groundwater, um, and you don't have good groundwater uh, if you are not taking care of the soil. Um, and so then this last point of climate change mitigation and adaptation, um, this comes from the understanding that the roots, the fungi, the animals that are all living in the soil, they are storing carbon for us. And we understand that uh, I I'm sure if you're at one of Claire's talks or you were led here by me, we are all on the understanding that um, the way that humans are interacting with the planet is in an unhealthy relationship. Uh, and, and there's a lot of potential to change our relationship with the soil and change this uh, dynamic. So what are the risks? I think it's good to quickly go through this, but I don't wanna to focus too much about it. I'd rather focus mostly on the solutions, um, but probably the biggest risks to soil are deforestation. This idea of getting rid of that structure, a lot of that uh, is related to and uh, happens in industrial agriculture, um, but industrial agriculture also has its own soil related issues, uh, pollution and contamination, uh, air pollution, soil pollution, urbanization. It's actually on a smaller level than you'd expect compared to the other three, but it does impact soil as well. So what are the solutions bubbling up in the soil? Um, before I go too much into the exact solutions, I want to talk a little bit about measurement because um, being able to measure how solutions are working, that's kind of my job right now. Um, but measurement really matters because you can only manage uh, what you can measure. And so if we really think about practically uh, what do solutions look like, we have to kind of step back and say, how do we know if something is being solved if we can't measure it? Um, so soil measurements, one of my favorite topics. Uh, how can I understand if the soil is healthy? Asking if soil is healthy is like asking if a human is healthy. And it's really hard because we're systems in and of ourselves, um, just like the soil is a system. And there's not necessarily one clear way to determine health. Uh, there are a lot of kind of proxy measurements that we can take that will help us to determine health. I know that a body mass index, for example, is a way that health is quantified uh, for humans. This is not a holistic measurement and not something that I necessarily condone. It's just an example of how measure, health measurements work and how they can be kind of reductive. 
Um, but with soil, what are we looking at? Option one, we can measure kind of the amount of organic matter or soil organic carbon that's in soil. And it is a really uh, kind of basic way of doing that where you compare the color of saturated soil. Um, you, the darker the uh, soil is, the more organic matter that's inside of it. Um, you can also measure the microbial respiration rates. I quite like this approach where you take a, a certain amount of soil and you measure the gas exchange. Humans are really good at measuring gas exchange. That's why we are tackling uh, the climate crisis because there is kind of this single measurement of uh, carbon emissions that we're able to look at. That's not quite true of biodiversity. Um, so we have to come, kind of come up with other ways. And this is one way of identifying how much life is in the soil is understanding how much how much are these microbes breathing and exchanging gas with the atmosphere. Um, and the third one is metabarcoding. And this is definitely the most uh, sophisticated of these three techniques. Um, what you do here is you take it kind of, I love this. This is, this is my favorite. Um, what you do here is you take, uh, some soil and, and mix it with probably some water and you extract the DNA out of that. Um, and then something that we are all familiar with in 2020 and 2021 is a PCR test. So you take, uh, the extracted DNA and you put it in the PCR machine, the same machine that gets our COVID tests, and it spits out uh, the different uh, genetic codes that are in that soil. So you can see how many different species, and then you can even put those species onto an evolutionary tree and see the spread of the species. So this is true of microbes. Um, and it can even show you kind of uh, if, you know, say there's some feces from a mole or some these types of things, you'd be able to even catch that DNA and then be able to compare it to some online databases and identify all the different species in the soil. So that's kind of a fun one. Um, but so once you have your measurements down, then you can start to talk about solutions. So, uh, one of the solutions that a lot of people are talking about right now are nature-based solutions. These are um, using nature to sequester carbon um, and to provide benefits to humans uh, that otherwise might be, uh, in this case of this image, uh, here they're using mangroves in order to protect a city from flooding. So typically you might see a seawall used in this case, but truly mangroves are have been designed for a very long time evolutionarily to serve this purpose, to protect flooding um, and to protect the agricultural land on the other side of these mangroves from getting saturated with salt water. Um, so this is a soil-based solution because we understand when we're using a nature-based solution that everything is connected. We're sequestering carbon in these mangrove roots. We're protecting the biodiversity of this estuary ecosystem and we're protecting the other side of this estuary from, from salt water uh, leaching. So I, I think nature-based solutions are really nice. Keep an eye out for those. I'm seeing them more and more uh, in my work. One specific example of a nature-based solution um, is regenerative agriculture. This is kind of taking that same concept of using nature's power um, to the benefit of humans. So working together rather than working against each other. Um, I like this image uh, below. It's from a German research institute. And they kind of have this whole interactive website where they show you how we go from having this monocropped single uh, species farmland um, where we're constantly growing something and sucking fertility and carbon and all that complexity that we talked about before out of the soil and continuing this process of extraction um, to one that looks kind of slowly as you move up 
with more species, more complexity, but more importantly, like more fertility in the soil means healthier plants and more nutritious plants. So this is really using soil to our advantage um, and increasing the biodiversity and increases the complexity. Once you have um, healthy biodiverse soils, then you're gonna have more um, beetles and more uh, ladybugs that can come and eat the pests and provide um, services, agroecological services for that farmland that wouldn't be there before. And that means that in extractive agriculture, what you really need is a lot of chemicals, both uh, fertilizers and pesticides in order to maintain the system. Uh, but rather when you're employing regenerative agricultural practices, you don't need these because the system itself is in equilibrium and you're able to uh, grow food. That's really the ideal situation. Um, we talked a little bit about kind of the structure of soil and how, um, and how the soil structure makes a big difference in terms of how much complexity is able to survive in the soil and also how water is able to filter through the soil. On the left side of the screen here, you can see um, that annual wheat versus perennial wheat and just uh, the imagery of the roots. So the plants here, the uh, above ground plant is really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to kind of that carbon storage. And really most of it is happening under the soil. Um, and I think the difference between the uh, perennial on the right and the annual on the left is pretty stark. We can see that um, when you're allowing uh, plants to grow and to maintain their root structure, you're also providing a space for mycelium and earthworms and a diverse microbiome in the soil and all of these things. And it really allows a complex system. It allows water filtration um, and, it, and it's just uh, something we can really be doing a lot more of promoting. Um, I just can't get over the difference in those roots. <laughs> and then I think this is uh, one of the last solutions that I'll we'll talk about, but it relates to the other two. They all kind of build on each other. And um, carbon markets are pretty special because it provides kind of the funding side of what's needed for uh, employing these soil-based solutions. And um, this example is, for the, from the Yurok tribe in California, um, who are able to tap into California's carbon markets and get paid for maintaining and restoring forest trees, which is super cool because not only um, are indigenous people first and foremost, the people who are protecting the world's biodiversity, um, but also being able to be funded for this protection is really in the way that we need to be moving as a society. Um, so all of these are the, is what is growing from the soils and uh, it's just, it's pretty exciting. So what, <clears throat> what can we do? Um, I think some of these are small and some of these are really big. So we can reject inequality. We can reject the idea that um, there needs to be such inequality that leads to such extractive practices and removal of our biodiversity and soil biodiversity uh, on this earth. Um, we can also follow the money, uh, which means that if you're extracting in this way, that's what leads to a lot of these kind of unequal situations. Um, <clears throat> and we're also in the same way, who are employing these regenerative solutions? For example, if you like Annie's mac and cheese, they have one that they're making with perennial wheat. Um, so maybe that's something that you would like to uh, purchase. And that is a good example of following the money. Um, also lobbying is a great way to get involved. There's a great group based um, in France called 
four per 1,000, um, and they helped lobby to get soil uh, carbon sequestration as part of the Paris Climate Agreements. Um, and they're really great and someone to follow their names because they're, uh, they believe that, or not they believe, the science suggests that four per 1,000 uh, parts carbon and the soil could uh, sequester all the carbon uh, necessary to maintain 1.5 degrees Celsius on Earth. Um, and finally, probably the most uh, realistic uh, getting your hands dirty exercise is gardening. I mean, we can really employ these regenerative gardening uh, techniques in our own gardens. For example, um, if you have a monoculture lawn, think about how you can diversify that, how you can avoid using um, chemicals and sprays and rather maybe let it go a little wild. Um, let the flowers go, maybe grow some of your own food to provide um, to provide uh, food for yourself and then uh, limit your need for extractive agriculture. Um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Louisa, thank you so much. Let me see. Okay, I just ended your screen sharing. Um, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. I find soil so fascinating and it was really great to do the deep dive. Um, we're going to go to the Q&A in one second, but I just wanted to say one thought that I had was um, before I really realized that I was an environmentalist, I was working a lot in social policy and community organizing. And one of the projects that I did was working with migrant farm workers in Coachella. And they were often getting so sick from working in the fields and being in contact with the chemicals that we were growing our food with. So when I saw that, that, that um, point about rejecting inequality, I think that it's so deep. The, the, the way that we're treating the people who grow our food and the way that we're treating the earth from which we're growing our food I feel like if you treat the farmers justly, then you will also be treating the soil more justly. And then, for, you know, say- Yeah, people really, people really need to be prepared to pay everybody a living wage. And once you are prepared to do that, a lot of things can kind of shift. And I think we can focus on, you know, soil, policy, but if we maintain inequality, then soil policy isn't going to be super relevant. So, um. right. right. Um, Lorena, do you want to go to the Q&A session real quick? And then I'll, I'll close with my poem, but I'll do it at the last, at the last poem. Louisa, thank you so much for sharing your expertise. This is an incredibly exciting topic and one that I feel like we don't take enough time to think about. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we only have one question. It seems like you answered all the, all the audience's questions. Um, what is the best way to prepare my soil for organic planting this summer? Right. Great question. I wonder who that's from, my mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think by mulching. So we can put the matter of kind of like the way that you build soil is by building organic matter in your soil. And so if you are ready uh, to get your garden ready for summer, uh, for spring, for what is it, Fall, uh, spring planting, put, start putting um, mulch on top. That can be kind of cut grass, the dead leaves from uh, the from the fall, what you always want is your soil covered. So bare soil will always um, kind of give off uh, carbon and other things and, and really what we are in a road. And so what we really want is covered soil with, um, yeah, with roots and roots and roots. Fantastic, thank you. And sorry, Claire, we have a follow-up question. Um, any movies or resources that we can share with others to spread the word? For soil resources, yeah. Um, 
uh, I guess it depends kind of what word we're spreading, kind of how we talked about before. Um, I think Claire's point about farm workers is essential. I really hope that everybody's understanding kind of the connection. We are the above ground life that relies on the soil. And if we can't get our kind of social systems to work for everybody, then um, our soil isn't gonna work for us. So I think that's an important point, but I also, I think if you're you're really wanting to get more connected with the soil, which is a really nice thing, um, I like, uh, depend. so if you're into soil biodiversity, there's the soil Global Soil Biodiversity Atlas, that's a nice read. Um, if you're uh, interested in this four per 1000 initiative, I really recommend checking them out as well. Um, I can give some links to some of my favorite short soil videos. One of them is by uh, Soil per one or four per one thousand, and one of them is a Royal Society soil video that I think Claire we might have linked to this. Um, that is a great watch. So I think if you want to learn more and you want to share with others, that is probably my favorite video to share around. Yeah. I'll also jump in and say that there's a really fantastic um, How to Save a Planet podcast episode about um, soil and farming and especially no-till farming, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and what, what I usually do is I will post this conversation and um, on YouTube and on Instagram, and I'll make a little summary of all the resources that we share, which in this talk is going to be really rich. So keep an eye out for that. Great. Thank you. And a last question. Um, do you have any tips for small scale regenerative gardening? So in balconies or other small spaces, how do we mix with plants and wildflowers for native plants? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm a balcony gardener, so I can really relate to that. Um, I like growing a lot of uh, edible flowers. I think with balcony gardening, it's really where's the bang for your buck um, in terms of space. Uh, and so growing uh, herbs is really the way to go, I think for that. Um, it, the, the issue of the like perennial roots is less of an issue when you're a balcony gardener for sure, but you can still build soil biodiversity. Um, you can also plant uh, something that I like to do is plant uh, seeds that you find around, for example, acorns. And so you can grow many oak trees on your balcony and then kind of reforest outside somewhere when they uh, grow to size. That's kind of a fun balcony trick uh, besides your basil and your chives and rosemary and that type of stuff. I love that. It's kind of like, what would the squirrels do? <laughs> Plant <Yeah>. the acorns. <laughs> but watch out because the squirrels might take all of your acorns. <laughs> That's also <laughs> happened to me. <laughs> That's excellent. Thank you so much. Um, okay, well, I, I will read a poem I wrote. I spontaneously just had to write a poem for dirt. Um, and, and I'm not a poet, uh, this is an amateur poem, but this is to encourage the spirit of, of loving and tending to the soil. Um, beneath, beneath the thicket, the fur of lichen, the soft blades, belly of meadow, there in the burrowing, there is a web of interstices, sightless constellations, a webbing of life in primordial dark, the soil, birther of everything, of my mother's love, my son's brow furrowed, the insects he observes, the universe in a handful of dirt. The dinner we break, the wash of light, the flame of blue sky, the roots anchoring this bowl of earth, breathing and feeding my body and yours, gravity, returning water to what we return to, the widening circle, the soil. And, and that's my love poem <laughs> to dirt. <laughs> um, 
Um, Louisa, thank you so much. I'm so happy that you joined us. It was lovely. And um, yeah, I want to invite everyone also for next week, I'm gonna be in conversation with artist Maryam Moma. Um, and Louisa is also gonna be joining us two more times. Um, as I mentioned, she's been a collaborator and a constant in my creative practice for a couple years now. So um, I'm so excited that she's here and sharing her knowledge with us. Louisa, thank you so much. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Lorena. Bye everyone. I'll be sharing the video soon. Have a lovely evening. Bye.